God, thank you for this divine appointment. God, in uh, these meetings this weekend, and God, for bringing Dan, we just are blessed and we give you praise. May you be glorified in Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Wow. Good deal. Ooh, what's this? I can get rid of this, can I? <laughs> Praise God. Y'all good? You sound excited this morning on a Saturday morning, huh? Uh, yeah, it's just awesome. I think we were believing that song we just sang. What a great gospel, huh? It's really amazing when you understand it. Uh, growing up my whole life, I didn't, I didn't understand it. The last 25 years, I, I think I'm getting it. And it's just awesome because there's fruit when you understand. The Bible says in all you're getting, in all you're getting, not some of you're getting, in all you're getting, get understanding. It doesn't say blessing, a promotion, a better job, protection, provision. It says in all, and all those things are awesome, but they're not your goal. Yeah. Your goal is understanding because when you have understanding, you'll go through every situation even when those things aren't happening in your life. A lot of Christians get tricked into a beneficial gospel where they get the idea that the only reason God's where he is, is to make your life work and happen the way you hope it does. And that's an absolute deception. I will never preach that. God did not pay a price for life to go the way you hope. He paid a price to live inside of you that you manifest him in the midst of however life goes so that you actually make him known through your life. So that in the situations you're in, whatever he would look like, that's what you look like. Because the Christ in you is the hope of glory. And somehow we got the idea that he's just here to bless us. He's here to transform us. He's here to fill us absolutely full of who he is. So who he is is the demonstration of our day. It's true. Like he wasn't discouraged. I don't buy into discouragement. A lot of Christians are discouraged. Like Sunday morning, people will fill churches all over the nation. But a lot of discouraged Christians will sit in their seats. And the reason they're discouraged is because they're self-focused and self-centered and life's not working for them or they think God failed them or they're letting something matter more than what matters most. And, and discouragement is always attached to a selfish motive. Yeah. And, and here's the thing, we get, we, get, we, get, we get lulled to sleep by this thing. We just think discouragement's normal and everybody's going to experience it. And when you talk about not being discouraged, we think it's high-minded and we're like in denial or stuff and feelings. Because we've so learned from ourselves, we haven't learned from Him. We're lording our own human experience above the ability of grace to change our lives. Come on, Jesus didn't teach me this stuff. I was homeschooled in the wrong home. I really was. I was in the wrong school. I was trained by a lie my whole life. The wisdom of the world was my tutor. The way that seemeth right to a man was my highest wisdom. And I just learned by default. I just learned by being on the earth. You just learned by happenstance. Some of it was just sheer instinct. Some of it you picked up along the way. But the mindsets and the motives of people's lives apart from Jesus are detrimental to the earth and to our own human lives and our destiny. So when we come into Christ, it's imperative that we put off the old and put on the new. We can't just say our sins are forgiven and yay, and we're going to heaven someday. No, no, no. You die in the likeness of his death. You put off the old man and you put on the new man. There's a great exchange. And all of a sudden, who Christ is is designed to come alive in you. You put on his why, his motive, his perspective, his reason for being. Are you with me? Come on, it's imperative, guys. You, if you're a Christian for you, let me just make a bold statement this morning because you guys are already alive and you can handle it. And we sang a great song, man. That song is a great song. Think about what we just sang. That God would send his son, that Jesus is our living hope, that he would care so much about what he created us to be that no matter where we've been, what we've done, or how we've lived, he has paid the price to preserve the truth of why we're here. And not just preserve the truth, but put it back inside of us. Like, think about that. Like, nothing's lost. Yeah. It's all restored through him. So he died on a cross. Think of the parallel of the cross and what we just sang. Jesus died on the cross, so you never will. Why? Because he never made man to die. He told Adam, the day you eat the tree is the day you surely die. So there was no death in the picture, in the vision of God. He's eternal. He's the author and giver of life. Right? So when he made Adam, he made Adam to live. There was no death in the picture. The day you eat the tree is the day death comes into your life. 
The reason we live forever is because he restored everything that was. In other words, he took away death and the power of death and the sting of death. Why? Because he never made man to die. So through Jesus, we're going to have what he intended from the beginning, apart from sin. So there's a transition. Our bodies will die because of sin, but to be absent from the bodies, present with the Lord. So like, let's stop fearing death. Let's stop being sentimental and just living for the moment. Let's live for the day we stand before him. How about that? Can I cheer you on in that? That's what faith does. Faith lives for the day you stand before him. Faith actually believes your every day is the day closer to when you stand before him. Life's a wisp and a vapor. I turned 58 in December. There's people here older than 58. There's people a lot younger than 58. But 58's coming for you younger folks, and it's coming quick. And when I was your age, I looked at a man like me and thought that was a fossil, man. Like, that's the ancient of days. Like, that dude's been around forever. Man, when I was 20, 40 was a geezer, man. Like, an old dude. I'm 58. I laugh about it because I'm so young inside and I just don't seem any different than I ever was. And I don't think I'm in denial. I'm just blessed and alive. But I'm 58 and young people are like, dude, that is a papa right there, man. That's like a grandpa. (laughs) Time's rolling. Time's rolling. Come on, man. You're little and you're, you're eight and you hang around some kids and somebody's 13 and they're like, you're a hero. You're like 13 and they jump higher and they're fast and you're like instant idol, right? 13. I'll never be 13. Next thing you know, you're 15 and next thing you know, you're driving and then you're 18 and then you're like, man. Then you're 21, and after 21, some people want to be 21 just so they can drink, you know. There's, after 21, there's no goals. <laughs> What's the goal after 21? Next thing you know, you're 25, and you're like, ah! And then you're 30, and you're looking sideways in the mirror to see if you're getting a belly. <sighs> and then you're 35, and then you're 40. There's no goals. When you're a kid, there's goals. 16, drive, 18, adult, don't have to listen to my mom. That's not true. (laughs) Yay, moms, I'm helping. Man, that's just scary when a child can't wait to be 18 because they think they don't have to submit to any authority. (laughs) But it's a goal, 21's a goal. After 21, come on, there's no goal. (laughs) Life's flying. What I'm telling you is some of us that had those goals are three times past those goals. I don't know why in my life, when I was young, I thought I'd never make it to 15. I don't know why 15 was. It was because I think I was around a kid that was 15, an instant hero thing. I was was like an idol. And And I remember being really small thinking 15 is so far away. I couldn't comprehend being 15. And next thing you know, I'm 30, and then I'm 45, and now I'm two years from four times 15. I'm telling stories. They're 40 years old. And they seem like current. I'm just making a point that time is flying, and there ain't no slowing down. You're way closer today than you ever were to standing before the Lord. And faith understands that. The just live by faith. Faith believes that. You have fellowship with God. You read your Bible and you understand that every day is taking you to that day that this life is a gift. That you have a gift called life. It's not a burden. It's not a dread. It's not a frustration. It's not a chore. It's a gift. And you're on the earth for one reason. Now here's the catch. If you don't step into that reason, life is a bummer sometimes. Life is tough. Life is difficult. Life's a bleep and a blank and... Don't be too crude filling in those blanks. But people say life is, and life bleep. No, life is a gift. And the only reason life seems like a grind to people is because every day they wake up and live it outside of why they're here so there's no empowerment from God on their life. Are you with me? Come on, but if you surrender, if you learn what it means to surrender and die to yourself, I'm going to try to talk about that a little bit, I think. I won't make no promises. I never know where I'm going. I'm on a journey with you. So I can't miss my notes today. I don't know how I didn't bring any. But I got a lot of files in my heart. <laughs> so we'll go somewhere. 
But selfishness, if you ever understand that selfishness is the biggest lie of your life, that you were never created for yourself, you were created for his image, for his love, for his nature, for the expression of God in your life. You weren't created to have a bunch of rights that could be violated. You inherited them through Adam, through the fall of man. All those rights, all those justifications to be angry and frustrated and in unforgiveness. Well, you don't know what they did to me. Well, if God said that about you, you're done. So it can't be good. It can't be holy. It can't be healthy. Well, you don't know what I've been through. wonder if Jesus copped that attitude halfway to the cross. Come on. He didn't teach us these things. Self-centeredness taught us these things. And every person in this room was born into self-centeredness. From little up, you had no identity. You had no clue who you were when you were little. You needed support, stability. You needed appreciation. You needed somebody to value you. You needed protection. And some of us didn't have a lot of those things on the list. And life's just going on. And you're just evolving and growing into your environment and your circumstance. And at a young age, you're no more than how you respond to how it unfolded. And we're pretty helpless and pretty vulnerable in that state. And then your identity revolves around your memory and your life and your past. That's why people cling to their story so deeply. Because it's the only place they've ever found any sense of identity. Whether good or bad. They think their life lived is who they are. What you're created to be is who you are. What Jesus accomplished is who you are. You're not a product of a shattered, tattered past. You're a product of a finished work called the cross. Yeah? Yeah? You say, well, my dad never loved me. I understand. Mine had a hard time too with all that alcohol and stuff. It wasn't pleasant at home. I understand what you're saying. You say, well, I was touched wrong. See, all of a sudden we have this list and this story to disqualify us from believing the truth. We got to get away from that, people. I'm not being insensitive. We all have a story. We all have a sad day. We all have a memory. wonder if I was touched wrong. Come on. Next thing you know, we start here and we go around the room and we just talk about everybody's bad story. By the end of the room, all we do is locate who's been through the most hell. And then the worship team comes up and we sing, it's all about heaven. And the person that's been through the worst, you only have the ability to talk to them because there's fear and trembling because you can't relate. You weren't through it as bad as them. So now you lost your voice and they won't even hear you anyway because you don't understand. Come on, I'm preaching a little bit right now. Sorry, I'm so intense. I'm not mad at you. You can tell I'm not mad at you. You know that, right? This stuff just hurts, folks. People believe wrong things. And their identity gets robbed and destiny gets robbed. And all of a sudden you can spend 20 years just believing one lie, and 20 years are shipwrecked through one lie. My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. God has done everything. We've got to step into it. We've got to put off self and everything that hinders and limits growing up into him in all things. Are you with me? It's such a lie, man. Self-centeredness is such a lie. Come on, at such a young age, we're already manipulated and and violated and molded and shaped. You, You get laughed at at a young age. You got options. You either get hard and insensitive. You become a fighter and say, well, I don't care. But the truth is you do care. That's why you're reacting. Or you get broken and insecure and introverted. But no matter how you respond, it's not you. It's just a reaction to the thing you're going through. But it's not the real you. It's not what you would look like if everything was in order. It's all manipulation. It's all deception. But then you grew up to believe that's you. Well, I've just always been that way. No, you became that way. Life molded you and shaped you, not the great potter. And you're a product of how things unfolded, not his life in you. That's why when you become a Christian, you can't hold on to your past. I wish, I wish we would get this as Christians and not make it like we have to always go back and look back. I promise you it's possible to let it all die by understanding and saying it doesn't matter who touched me. It doesn't matter who didn't love me. It doesn't matter what betrayal. It doesn't matter what hell, what pain, what dark night. It doesn't matter. The light has come. Jesus came and showed me the truth about me. And everybody involved in my life before today didn't have a clue. And if they really knew, they wouldn't have touched me the way they touched me. They wouldn't have acted 
day way they acted. Men are lost in deficit. And if I'm trying to drink out of dry cups, of course I'm thirsty. But one rose up out of the midst of the confusion and said, if you'd ask of me, I would have gave you a drink. And you would take one drink, just one drink, and you would never, ever thirst again. What's he talking about? Is he talking about running a marathon and being thirsty? No. He's talking about identity. That longing inside to know who you are. He's talking about that thing. That hollow empty thing that drives people. He's saying man if you drink of me. You'd know the truth about you through me. And you'd never go longing again. Come on it's the truth of the gospel. And it's possible and I'm passionate about it. And I'm not apologizing. He shed his blood for this thing. He went through so much injustice. Nobody will ever go through what Jesus went through because he was totally perfect and totally pure. He didn't deserve one ounce of what came to him. Nobody took his life. He freely laid it down. He faced the injustice. He handled it. He just manned up. I like that. God manned up. (laughs) Yeah. And did it as a man empowered by God and showed us what wisdom in God looks like through a man. Showed us what the love of God looks like through a man. Showed us what mercy looks like through a man. He didn't just come and preach a sermon to us. He put flesh on the sermon. And he dwelt among us and we beheld him in glory, in grace and truth. Yeah? Oh, he's my hero. He is so much more than a suffering savior and the forgiveness of sins. He's the manifestation of God on the earth and he's our model for life and he's the one we're supposed to follow. We're not supposed to follow our feelings, our experiences, our friends' advice. We're supposed to follow his life. We're supposed to follow his life. And if it wasn't possible through the person of Holy Spirit, he would not invite you. And he would not say, follow me if you couldn't. So don't sell cheap because you're not for sale. He bought you with his blood. It says your life's not your own. See, that's the thing. Our lives have never been our own. And we think it's freedom of choice and freedom of all this stuff. Well, it's my life. Never was your life. It was always designed to be his life in you. That's what makes man work. His life in you. Christ in you. The hope of glory. That's why suicide is one of the biggest expressed deceptions and tragedies on the planet. Because a man gets so self-centered and inward, no matter what his reason for suicide, he believes it's an option and he actually takes what was never his. If I'd take a show of hands and you were honest, you'd be amazed how many people for a season in their life at some point thought suicide was an option. Actually considered it, was tempted by it and tested by it. Be honest with me. Be humble. It's no reflection on you. Who was tempted by that? Who had that as an option? Look around. That's a lot of hands in a small room. Why? Because Satan wants men to live as if they're alone. As if it's all about them. If if they have the choice and the right to make a choice like that concerning their own life. And miss the fact that it's not even theirs. It was never yours. Your life was never your life. Your life. It was always designed to be his life in you. There's a covenant there. It's I in you, you in me. And when you live your life apart from him, it's individual, it's, it's individualistic, it's self-centered, and it's deceived. And all of a sudden, you take into your hands and make choices that aren't yours to make. That's why there's the big fight over abortion and pro-life and all this stuff. And, 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 and there's a war in the two camps. Why? Because... And, and because people believe, hey, it's my life, I'll do with it what I want, the baby, it's my body, nobody's going to tell me what I can do. And all of a sudden you get so far gone that you even assume the right over another life because it's in yours. That's how twisted it gets. It's all deception. And I'll say it boldly with the tape running. It's all deception. It's demonic. It's lies. It's self-centeredness to the core. The worst he could do is shoot me for saying something like that, and I'm not going to die anyway. (laughs) Be better to torture me a little first or something. (laughs) Make me pay (laughs) for getting in your face. (laughs) Just think how people are, how, how a 
offensive people get, like offended because they, things are so offensive. And how dare you talk to me about my sexual preference? And how dare you talk to me about my choice with my own, my pregnancy? It's not your pregnancy. Life comes from God. There's a time to be born. He numbers people's days in the womb. He forms people in their mother's womb. It's not your pregnancy. He has a whole lot to do with the life inside of you, friend. There's a time to be born. You were predestined before the foundation of the world to be adopted as sons and daughters. There's 500 million sperm cells racing for one egg and one cell got in there and it's the life in the womb. You're telling me that's happenstance? 500 million racing for one egg. Boom, the gun shoots and they all shoot up the... This whole school of salmon racing up the canal, man. And there's one goal. One gets in one. Predestined before the foundation. And you're going to think you're a misfit. And, and this God in this whole thing. The author and giver of life. There's a time to be born. You're sitting here. That tells me your life is the will of God. Period. Period. And Satan is working in people at a very young age. You don't belong. You don't fit in. Nobody loves you. Making it all about you and your feelings. You and your emptiness. You and your confusion. You, you, you. It's all about you. Man, that is so vulnerable of a place. And if you don't deal with that as you get older, you get harder in that and possessive in that. There ain't nobody telling you what to do. And nobody telling you what you do with your body. And nobody telling you what you do with your preferences. And nobody... And then all of a sudden, you're ready to fight. But you're fighting the wrong fight. It's not the good fight of faith. It's the fight of self-centeredness. It's just all about you. And there's an amazing scripture in the Bible that says, if you, if you don't die, if you don't die and fall to the ground, if the seed doesn't die, it abides alone. And what's going to happen is in that place, you fought to be right your whole life and you stood for your rights and you defended your rights and you defended yourself. And when your life expires, you're going to find that that's all there was to it. Your life, your menial life on this temporal scale of time. And it was just the time you had on the earth. And the whole reason you were here was to multiply Christ and to manifest him. Now just think how empty that is. If the seed doesn't fall to the ground and die, it abides uh, that means at the end of your journey, you have a blank canvas. At the end of your journey, you have a blank canvas. When you're born, you've got a blank canvas called legacy. At the end of your journey, you've got a blank canvas at the end of your days. Why? Because you expended it on yourself. That's a sober thought. Wouldn't it be amazing at the end of your days if your canvas was just full and covered? With forests of trees. Wonder if your canvas just looked like mountains and you were an egg corn, you were an oak tree, and all of a sudden your whole canvas, which is full of robust oak forests as far as you can see, representing people and lives that were touched and changed because of the way you walked and lived, because you loved not your own life unto death. Because you denied yourself and picked up your cross and you followed the king. And you didn't repay evil for evil. You overcame evil with good. You didn't return a harsh word with a harsh word. You, you, you calmed down a harsh word with a kind word. You let mercy triumph over judgment. You let love cover a multitude of sin. You didn't just give your shirt. You gave your tunic, your cloak. You, gave, you went another mile. Wouldn't that be awesome? If that's your canvas. Faith says that matters. Anything else says whatever. But faith understands what I'm saying. Flesh says, well, you don't know what they did to me. Well, that hurt. Well, they should know better. They were in the church longer than me. And all of a sudden, you find a reason and a justification to be found outside of his image. And I promise you, that'll always be deception. It doesn't matter how knit your facts are. Because if God pulled those facts on you, you have no hope. It's outside of his justice. It's outside of his judgment. Y'all good? Y'all okay? I'm still not sure where we're going and what we're doing. <laughs> Figure the more I talk, I'll find out sooner or later. It'll make sense. You getting anything out of this? Yeah? yeah? Good. Because it's one of those mornings where I'm like, Lord, where are we? What are we doing? 
feels passionate. I know I said a lot. I'm not sure what we did. <laughs> it's one of those mornings. They're usually good mornings. I don't fight them. <laughs> they're a blur to me, but they seem good to people. Some people in the morning when it's a blur to me, they're like, that was so bad. I'm like, really? Good. <laughs> I wasn't so sure where we were. <laughs> Here's the bottom line. There's a lot of things trying to mold your life, win your heart, and own you. All through life, there's a whole lot of things trying to buy you out and win you over and lock you in and begin to mold and shape your life. And if you're not careful at a very young age, you can let one event just start dictating you. You can get a hard heart towards somebody and never let it go. You can use it as a language. You can say, well, somebody mentions a dad, and you say, yeah, well, you didn't know my dad. Well, yeah, my dad wasn't, well, yeah. And you're 30, now you're 35, and you're still muttering out about your dad when you were eight. Come on. Me standing here, bro, just saying that as an example ought to be enough to go, whoa, that can't be wise, and that can't be cool. No matter how real it feels, that can't be healthy. I'm going to make a strong comment. And it's not insensitive because my dad was alcoholic. My dad, I had to pick my dad up from the bar when I was driving and, and he couldn't even walk. He'd drink two beers and he couldn't walk. He'd swallow the first one down and his body would try to throw up and reject it. And the second beer went right into his bloodstream and beer's what? Percent. It's not much. And he couldn't even walk. When I was a kid, he'd drink a whole case watching sports and I didn't even know he was drinking. And finally his body said, I had enough. You're not putting any more in here. He was bleeding out his behind and didn't seem to care. He had cirrhosis in his liver, didn't seem to care. He's in ICU on all the hookups, and as soon as the nurse walks out of the room, he unplugs himself and unhooks the stuff, slips on his clothes and heads to the bar. That's how bad it was. My mom got a call from the hospital. We lost your husband. He's not here. She said, oh, I know where he is. She called the bar like any other day. Hey, can I speak to Dave? Hang on. Hello? What are you doing? Oh, I wasn't staying there. That was my dad. And he seemed, he seemed like a functional alcoholic in a sense. He still worked, and, but he wasn't there. I could sit here and say, he robbed me of all kind of dad time. He never, one time in my life, one time we walked down to the park when I was a young teenager because I kept threatening him and challenging him that I could beat him in wall ball. One time in my life. Dad walked to the park and we played one game of wall ball in my whole life. I could be angry about that, guys. I could justify that. I could have a camp around me of people that have the same stories and we could be a group. (laughs) Isn't that what we do? Don't hurting people surround themselves with people that understand their pain? Not people that have answers for their pain, people that understand and sympathize with their pain. The last thing you need is a crew of sympathy around you and empower you to stay where you're not producing fruit. The last thing you need is four people to wrap their arm around you and just understand. How are you helping people when that's all you do? Sometimes you reduce them to the highest grace they can receive in their life is the fact that you seem to care about their story. And that's why you're their friend, because you care and you understand. How is that helping them be free? Tomorrow's always yesterday. Come on. Now I need somebody to sit me down and say, listen, at the risk of offending me, at the risk of me knocking them right in the teeth, listen, what does it matter that your dad lived that way now that Christ has come? Now that you have found truth and purpose and life in him, why are you letting what your dad wasn't matter more than who he is? Why are you letting what one man said or didn't say matter more than one man has proclaimed forever? Why are you letting your life override his life in you? Yeah? You want to look at a cool scripture? Yeah? You sure? (laughs) Go to 1 Corinthians with me, would you? Let's make it a legal meeting. I'll read out of my Bible. (laughs) I don't think I did last night. You could probably throw everything I said away. I never read out of my Bible. 
People say that stuff, you know. Got an email once. He said, man, I've been watching Pastor Dan, but you know what bothers me? Sometimes he preaches and he never reads his, out of his Bible. Man, don't sell that cheap. If you listen, I quote like two-thirds of it. <laughs> and wrap everything. All, I got to have scripture around every comment I make. Every point I try to prove, it's wrapped with three scriptures. Listen to tapes. I don't just say anything from the place of opinion. When I make a comment that sounds like an opinion, it's backed with two, three scriptures right in a row. And then I'll make a little bit more of a statement and tie it in with two more. All the time. That's why I'm so convinced. Because I found the answers in him. I kind of like really believe he's the truth. <laughs> I don't believe he's the way or a good idea or an option. I believe he's the way. And I'm going to live Jesus the rest of my life. And I'm just cheering a lot of people on to come running with me. Because the truth is I'm here because I want to be. I'm going to fly home to PA tomorrow, God willing. And if he comes back and gets us all, then that'll be a wrap. But if not, I'm going to fly back home. And at some point, the last two times I flew out of your airport, they delayed me and I had to stay overnight in Atlanta. So we'll see what happens. But <laughs> it's all good. It's not my life. It's just somebody else to love. So you stand waiting for your shuttle of the hotel and you're ministering to a person beside you. I remember it well. You just take opportunity. You don't stand there and say, what did I do wrong that God caused me to miss my flight? <laughs> self-centered things, stop. Yeah. <laughs> That's self-centered. <laughs> you see everything as an opportunity. Are you following me? Yes. Yeah? Yeah. So let me back up here. Let me, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to finish that comment. We don't have to. Just kind of talking about the way I live. And it's fun the way I live. I'm just going to stay blessed and excited. Just want to cheer you on to do the same. So uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Are you there? Yeah. It's amazing. Verse 19. I'll just jump in 19. It says, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. The wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. Now, I have another section of scripture I'm trying to get to down here, but I backed up and I read that. I'm really glad I did. Let's back up one more verse. Thank you. Wow. Let no one deceive himself. Sounds like we might be good at that, huh? Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. Come on, this is the Bible. What's he saying? The wisdom you were trained by is foolishness to God. And if you're wise in this age, you don't know a thing. You need to throw that away so you can actually become wise. Because until you throw that away, you can't become wise because you believe this is right. It's called the way that seemeth right. It's when it gives you a right. To be anything less than what his image looks like. It's when you have this court thing in your mind and saying, well, that was really wrong. Well, they should have known better. Well, now I can't trust anybody. Now I'm, I'm shook. I'm going to just put up walls and I have to protect myself from him and her. And, and now you look at everybody with a raised brow because you were hurt and you don't let nobody close and da, da, da. Come on. That is so isolated. That is such a lonely place. That is so outside of how Jesus lived and who he is and who he created you to be. What he's saying is if you don't let go of the wisdom of this age, you'll never be wise in Christ Jesus. If your rights matter more than walking in love, then you'll just stay in your rights is what he's saying. You'll never walk in love. If you live in a he said, she said, tit for tat world, you'll never be wise in Christ Jesus. You can go to church. You can serve on a mission team. You can feed the hungry every Saturday. But you won't walk in the wisdom of God. And you'll let so many things matter more than what matters most. And you'll let life speak way louder than truth. And that's a problem because truth makes you free, not life. Are you with me? Yes. Come on, I've pastored for a while. I've 25 years saved. I've seen a lot of Christians with a lot of issues. A lot of hurt, a lot of stories, and it usually involves others. Who's a teacher or a counselor? Who spends time ministering to people here? You've ministered to people. Tell me if I'm right or wrong. 90, high 90% of counseling is people struggling with people. 
Sometimes they're walking through a situation, but in it, they usually, like just the natural, like their job, but it usually involves turmoil or struggles with others. Yes. True? Yes. It's just an absolute indictment against us that we don't totally understand the cross and why we woke up in the morning. Come on. If I'm going to be tricked into letting where my wife isn't decide where I am, I'm being deceived. It's the wisdom of the world. I have to become a fool if I'm ever going to become wise. Yeah? Then you got people in the world saying, well, you need to stand up for yourself. Well, you're just a doormat. Well, you shouldn't let anybody walk over you like that. You try to have that conversation with Jesus and tell him he was a doormat. You tell him he was being passive. Needs to stand more for his rights that he's an enabler. Yeah, you save that psychology, that psychotic whatever. Because <laughs> it's not, it's not going to fit. I'm not going to ever wear that. It's not going to produce life. The last thing I need is a right to have a right when I died to myself. How do we Christians deny ourselves and have so many rights? Nobody's ever explained that to me in 25 years. How have we really denied ourselves and have so many rights? To be hurt, frustrated, discouraged, disappointed, let down, even mad at God. Do you know how many Christians go to church tomorrow and deep in their heart they're mad at God and disappointed with the Lord? That's because we've ta taught a self-centered gospel that serves us instead of transforms us. And we preach beneficial messages instead of transformational messages. Come on, I'm just saying it plain. You can get mad at me if you want, but that's a giveaway. You're already located. If you're sitting there mad at what I'm saying, warning. That's a major warning. No, don't leave, man. Don't be mad. <laughs> He's such a good guy. It's so fun to do that to a guy like that. <laughs> you see how he didn't even look back? He just bolted, man. We'll just trust that God's working on him. Because he has such precious children. I just want to see him do well, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> seriously like these actually these kind of things I'm saying are so scriptural like I'm reading it right out of the Bible they shouldn't be hard to swallow like it's amazing how touchy people get and how off on guard and they get mad at things real sensitive that's a warning sign to you if you're that sensitive what are you protecting so dearly what are you guarding because if it's self-centeredness, that should have been dead long ago. Yeah? Putting up walls, guarding yourself. You're not your own defense. He's your rock in defense. He's changing your mindset, your motives, your perspective. He's the one that defends you with the truth. You see how people talk like that about guarding yourself? Don't let nobody too close. Wait till you get to really know them. What they're saying is you're vulnerable and you're always going to be hurt unless people do you right. And then we're living in a church age that if we're not careful, we preach otherwise. We're in denial. We're not keeping it real. We're not relating. And we're stuffing feelings. And all of a sudden, what we're doing is our human experience is the highest truth. So we're really following ourselves as we're saying we're following him. Because what we've all been through is our normal and our reality. No, what he's been through is our normal and our reality. We got to grow into him in all things. So this Christian journey is amazing. Have fun with it. Like have the time of your life and grow in truth. And don't get condemned. And if you feel like you're messing up, don't stop. Don't, don't stop and don't quit and say, oh, I blew it. No, you didn't blow it. Grow up into him. Say, wow, man, truth's working in my heart. I see that. That's so not who you are. I'm coming more after you, God. You're making me wiser and sharper. This is awesome. Mold me and shape me and make me more and more like you. I want to walk in love. Thank you for loving me, God. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And then you get caught up in some and you realize, man, I was so offended. How did I get there? Don't sit and throw away and question after two hours if you're even saved. That's what people do. <laughs> well, I should so know better. Man, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I'm still, man, maybe I'm not sincere. Maybe I was never saved in the first place. Ah, stop, slow down the train. No, you got caught up in a dictate of flesh. You've been trained that way your whole life and God's refathering you from above and he's empowering your life to walk in change and you bumped into the old. Put it off immediately and run to him. Don't run from him and put on fig leaves. That never works. We found that out. That's not cool. You don't look good in fig leaves, I promise. <laughs> you look way better in a robe of righteousness. And let him clothe you. Amen?
So when that happens, you run to him. Remember yesterday I said I didn't find a way to sin and get away with it. I found a way to be free from it. That's what I'm talking about. I'm running to him. I'm not taking it lightly. I'm not saying, oh, well, he forgives me. See how God works? See how conviction works? <laughs> Came right back, man. I'm so glad God's moving in your life, man. <laughs> he doesn't even know what's going on. He's like, what? You do, don't you? <laughs> you just played that so good, you just confidently walked out of here. <laughs> See, he only got about halfway through the building and God whacked him. <laughs> brought him back. God is moving here this morning. <laughs> okay, let me just read this. I got to get somewhere. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of the world, he said, she said, tit for tat, your rights. Yeah? All about me. What about me? The wisdom of the world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile. Why? Because in the end, they'll amount to zero when it all really matters. That's scary. That's like sobering to me. Like, whoa, when I say scary, I don't mean ah, frightening in that sense. Like, boo, ah, scary, sobering, like, wow. I don't want to freak you out this morning. I'm not going to try to get theology theologically with you uh, like uh, challenging I don't want you to run I'm not talking about heaven or hell okay but just watch this in Matthew 25 there were sheep and there were goats you all know that if you read the story the only difference between the sheep and the goats it wasn't that one prayed a prayer and the other one didn't it was that the one group saw past themselves to the needs of others and stepped in the others didn't even see the needs of others. They were goats. These were sheep. That's pretty intense. It, they didn't say one went to church regularly, the other one didn't. One prayed a prayer, one got baptized, one group didn't. It simply said, when you saw they were hungry, you gave them something to eat. When you saw they were naked, you clothed them. When they were sick, you visited. When they were in prison, you went there. And they said, when did we, he said, when I was, when I was sick, when I was in prison, when I, and he said, they said, the group of sheep said, when did we see you sick, naked, hungry, in prison? And he said, when you did it to the least of these, you did it unto me. And then he said to the other group, he said, when you saw me hungry, you didn't feed me. When you saw me naked, you didn't clothe me. When you saw me sick, you never came to visit me. When you saw me in prison, you didn't show up. And they said, when did we see you in all these situations? He said, when you failed to do it to the least of these, you failed to do it unto me. Now, you can't get away from the word. You can do all you want. Yeah, but... But the truth in that story is the only thing that separated the two groups was the one group loved others with their lives and the other group loved themselves and didn't see the need in others. That's what the story means. And that's the only thing in the story that separated the two. Well, let me be straight with you. If love lays down its life for another, how can we actually become love and not see the need in others and, and at least step in in some level. I'm not talking about legalism and works and you have to do X amount and this much. And I'm just talking about just, just giving what you can, just stopping, just seeing somebody bewildered on a park bench and you're walking by and you got to make supper and understand we got families, but you just see it. And when you see it, you see it and it's like, whoa. And then it's on your mind. Who's ever had that happen? Who's ever seen somebody and you perceive turmoil in their life or struggle and you noticed it in public? But you're in a hurry. You got a schedule. And I get that. But man, I'll tell you, it's amazing. If you just slide in on the bench and you got your three bags and you're on a time schedule and you just say, hey, man, I just walked by. My heart went out to you. I felt like you're really going through it right now and you're distraught. Yeah. Uh, no, listen, I noticed it. Please, I'm just going to pray for you. 
You don't have to say anything. Father, I just thank you right now and that you grant them wisdom. Next thing you know, you don't even know this. You might be praying out the very thing there. It's just amazing how God does that. And now you're walking to the car and you say, well, what's that? That's not really a big deal. It's not like I led them to the Lord. You gave them the Lord. You stopped in the middle of turmoil and sowed a seed that Holy Spirit can breathe on and grow into something. The kingdom of God is if a man scatters seed. If we don't throw out seed, if we don't scatter seed, what's going to grow? Where's the harvest coming from if we don't plant? You're just going to pray for a harvest and not plant? That's like the farmer looking out the window. Mildred, I don't know where the corn is this year. Well, Charlie, I don't even remember you getting on a tractor. Well, I was just believing for corn. <laughs> Come on, it's silly. You sow, you water, and you reap. It's the way it is. It's the way it's always been. We intercede and pray for a move of God in our city with sincerity. And sometimes we just really, really pray a lot. But we don't sow into our prayers. We don't sow into people's lives. You can't just get in a room and just pray for God to move when you're part of the move of God. Like if you're the body and I'm the body of Christ, that ought to have expression and function. Is prayer important and powerful? Absolutely. But I promise you, loving people and stopping on that park bench and just walking over and saying, hey man, I just feel like you got a, a lot going on in your mind. And man, I don't know. I'm just, I could be wrong, but I heard marriage and I feel like you're in a real marriage situation. They're looking at you now and their eyes are like this and you got their total attention. How do you know about my marriage? Well, I saw your face and you looked kind of like troubled. And in my heart, I'm a Christian. And I said, Lord, what's going on? And I thought I heard the word marriage. And then you just give them a little insight. You just give them one line or two that comes out of your heart and you pray with them. Man, it's amazing where God can take that. I get so many testimonies and stories from people and, that were touched like that and little just blinks and boop. And I travel all the time. I, I, you saw last night. I, I just hang out. I talk. I, I, I feel like I perceive things. And I, the worst I could be is wrong. I'd rather say it and be wrong than be right and say nothing. You'd be amazed how people come to me that I haven't seen for five years. They say, you probably will never remember this, but you pulled me over in a corner or you sat down or you walked by me and said this and it just burned in me and you walked away and I started to weep and I felt the presence of the Lord and God took what you said and built it into a truth in my life and blah, 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 blah. And they'll tell me this crazy testimony and I had no clue the whole time. I was just loving people along the way, just loving people. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Whoa. So what's that canvas going to look like in that day? We're going for a canvas, baby. Throwing all kinds of paint on there. Y'all good? I'm wrapping up. We're going to head somewhere. I'm going to make a point here. I actually know where we're going finally. Because I started off in the beginning about our past and leaning on our past. I asked the Lord about a year ago. It was only a year ago. I don't even know if it was a year. I bet eight, nine months ago. I lay on my bed and I said, Lord, why do people hold on so tight to their past? Why does it seem so hard to talk people past their past? Why do they keep going back? Well, you don't know what it's like when I was growing up. Well, you don't know what so-and-so did to me. Well, you don't know what I've been through. Well, you don't know. Because in the long run, we're going to find it was a justification for us being whatever we were. So we're giving people the power to make us or break us. And people that don't have a strong understanding of God are mad at God for their story. Are you with me? Yeah. Well, if he was good, why did he let me go through that? Well, if he was really good, why did he let him touch me like that? We don't realize that the whole earth is under the sway of the wicked one, that men are accountable for their life, that men should be sowing the gospel into each other. Families should be set apart and sanctified. And unfortunately, that's not the way it is. So you get touched by wrong things and sin and it tries to take advantage over you and get your heart so hard that when you hear the good news, you can't hear anything good because you have issues. Come on, I'm just talking raw this morning. I'm not that far off. And you got this heap of issues piled up and all these stories and memories. And when you hear good news or you hear a song that he's a good, good father, you're thinking, yeah, if he was a good, good father, I wouldn't. Have. Well, if he's a good, good father, then why? And all of a sudden there's a fence in your heart towards the only one that's good. 
Why? Because of the self-centered deception and the ability to process in a way that has to do with you at the cost of him. And if you really understood the value of your life and the purpose of your life, you wouldn't be able to go there. You would cut that thing off. It wouldn't even have a voice. Why? Because you put that off. You became a fool to that kind of knowledge so you could truly become wise. I promise you tomorrow in this country, there's going to be countless Christians attending church that are hurt, discouraged, frustrated, offended. If that's the case, we're not shining as lights and the world's not getting a good look at him. They just see a Christian group of people. That represent what they say they believe, but don't represent him. It's really true, because watch this. You can fill every church seat tomorrow, every church seat in this country, and it would make certain pastors happy and maybe make the offering look better than it's looked. But the truth and the raw reality is you can fill every single church tomorrow in this country, every seat, and it doesn't mean anything will change in life or the world. But if everybody that goes to church tomorrow starts growing into love and becoming love and manifesting his image, it's going to have to bring change. And everybody's sphere of influence times everybody's sphere of influence. All of a sudden, we're rocking the world with love. And all of a sudden, we're manifesting Jesus. And we got so many seeds in the earth that a harvest has to come. Are you with me? Come on. You can grow in knowledge about him or you can grow in him. It's two different things. We can fill every church and it won't change a thing just because we filled church. But if we become love, it has to change your workplace. It has to change your family. It has to influence your marriage. I'm not talking about your spouse becoming love. I'm talking about you becoming love. See, we make our marriage so conditional and we've believed a lie. Nope, you better become, you better become, put it all away and become a a fool so you can become wise. If you don't put away that wisdom, How are you ever going to grow in love? If your expression is conditional on others, then others, you're only as strong as the weakness around you. And all of a sudden, Christ isn't the Lord of your life. Other things are governing and dominating your disposition. You can say he's Lord, but you're letting other things matter more. You say, why are you so run down? You, oh man, you don't know. If you lived in my home and had to put up with, I've been holding on good, actually. I'm on probably going way longer than I'm buying time right now, buddy. What, what are you talking about? Oh, you don't know what it's been like. I mean, I've heard these conversations. And I'm like, oh, man, we don't understand the gospel at all. It's because we're tricked into finding our identity and our value through others. The average Christian in the church believes the people they love the most have the right to hurt them the most. The people they're closest to can hurt them the most. And they're the ones you say you love, and love takes no account of the wrong done. I bet we don't understand love. I bet they're the people we need to make our identity. Come on, be honest with me. The average person in the church believes the people closest to them can shatter them and hurt them the most. But you have to become a fool to this age if you're ever going to be wise in him. And if the way you're responding isn't producing life, it can't be the Lord. Are you with me? Remember the little bummed out Jesus thing I did? We're all giggling and laughing because it's silly. So he never taught us that. We got to be put this age away. And here's what I want you to see. And I'll tie this up and we'll, we'll be done in good time this morning. For the wisdom of this world's fulliness with God. I'm reading it again for a reason. For it is written. He catches the wise in their own craftiness. The Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile. Be important to really believe that. They're futile. <laughs> okay. So therefore, let no one boast in men. All right. The reason this chapter, if you know, in the beginning of this chapter, there was people saying, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Paul, I'm of Cephas. There was people claiming rights to speakers. You know, oh, I was led to the Lord by so-and-so. Well, I was baptized by so-and-so. Well, well, I go over to this church. I sit under so-and-so. And there was a weirdness going on where people were, 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 were finding some weird identity in the men they were sitting under. It was a weirdness. It was a pride. It was a wrong thing. And Paul's addressing it. Paul was good at addressing that stuff. I wish we would get that. Like, 
I wish we would understand that no man has a thing unless it's given. That there's absolutely no boasting in men. We can appreciate and honor people to a certain degree, but we have to understand the grace on their life is truly grace. Like if, 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 if there's a teacher and he has revelation, it's because God's letting him see. It's not because he's more important or more special or more spiritual than the next Christian. It's just that the grace he walks in allows him to see what others haven't seen. So he declares it and in that grace helps all see. There's no hotshot Christian. There's just people that believe. Like all we should be guilty of in that day is believing him. Nobody's going to wear a super Christian cape, fly through the ranks, and you go, whoa, he was always just the best, man. There's no Christian Emmy Awards. There's no none of that. There's just a whole group of people that believe in glory to the king. Right? Yeah. Okay, this is important. You guys are going to get this, I promise. I'm just taking my time getting there. Let no one boast in men. Therefore, therefore. So Paul's knocking this sectarianism thing out. He's saying, man, would you guys stop saying I'm of him, I'm of him, I'm of him, and letting it cause a divisiveness and a division among you? Come on. Don't we all have grace? Don't we all have gifting? Aren't we just walking in what God has given us? There's no boasting in men. You know, that kind of thing. And he's trying to line these. The Corinthians, he did a lot of correcting in the Corinthian church. (laughs) There's a lot of language because he was actually correcting them. But we can learn from it. Therefore, there's no boasting. Let no one boast in men. For all things are yours. So what's he saying? The things you see in men's lives that they're trying to impart are for you anyway, right? So it's it's not about elevating the messenger. It's about embracing the message. Because the whole reason the messenger is anointed is to multiply the grace among as many as would believe. So the prophet that's in the office of a prophet isn't anointed just to prophesy over everybody in the room. He's to inspire people to speak divinely utter, divine utterance and by divine manner so that they all might prophesy at some level. Here's what we do. We recognize a prophet. We call a conference and a thousand people gather to get a word. And the highest anointing on his life is to multiply people to speak by the inspiration of the spirit in their job, on the streets, in their family. Are you with me? And then we look at the office of the prophet and and the honor becomes, gets kind of strange. And all of a sudden we give them beyond what grace is. I think you're following me. Don't boast in men, for all things are yours. What's he say? Fear not, little flock. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Now, here's what I want you to see. Whether it's the men and the teachers and the people in your lives, Paul, whether it's Apollos, whether it's Cephas, he's still addressing this thing. Now, watch. All things are yours, whether Paul, Apollos, Cephas, or the world. Wow. I guess that goes back to Genesis. Created you to subdue, not be subdued, to have dominion in Christ, in the wisdom of God, right? All things are yours, whether the world, whether life or death. Why? Because he gives you life through Jesus Christ. He tells us we have authority to even raise the dead. We have actually he's given us power over death. Death won't have dominion over us. Nobody's going to die the death of death through Christ Jesus. Do you see what I mean? You're alive in him. So you have all things are yours, whether life, death, whether it's the world, the men in your life that are teaching, the the ministers, whether it's the world, whether it's life, death. This is a pretty inclusive list. I mean, this is kind of covering all the ground in a short sentence. Watch. Whether things present, whether things to come, dash, all are yours. Everything on this list, it's yours. Present things. So you have life today in Christ. Seize it. If you wake up tomorrow, it's mercy, it's a gift, seize it and live by faith and go after God and grow up into Him in all things and write a legacy. What he's saying is you got everything here you need. So it's all yours. But when you look, there's something not on this list that's not yours. This list is pretty inclusive. The world, things present, things to come, life, death, that's a pretty serious list. Guess what's not on the list? Your past. Why is your past not on the list? 
It's not yours in Christ. You're a new creation. He bought it out. He put it in a sea called forgetfulness. He remembers it no more. Why do we live by it when he forgets it? Hallelujah. You don't even have permission in Scripture to live in your past. It's not yours. You have the present and things to come. Look, you're not Lot's wife. You're his bride. You don't look back to where you were delivered from and get frozen to where you're heading. You look up from whence comes your help. You're married to another now. You're not married on the earth. You're married in him. Paul said, I haven't apprehended. I haven't arrived to that point where he's taken me. I haven't laid a hold of that which he laid a hold of me for. But there's one thing I do to get there. To assure that I'm getting there. There's one thing I do. I forget what lies behind. And I reach forward to what lies ahead. The only thing not on that list is the past. You got the world. You got life. You got death. You got things present. Things come. That's inclusive. You don't have the past on the list because it's not yours. It's his. It's not even legal for Christians. We spend countless hours trying to pull people through because of feelings, hooks, connections with yesterday. If we could teach the body of Christ that you shouldn't give those things so much power to keep you there when you're here. That there's a place in your life to put it off and put it on. Yeah? Yeah. To get alone in a bedroom and say, look, I realized my dad was never there for me and it tried to affect me in different ways. But the truth is, none of that has anything to do with who I am now with you and me. And God, I just thank you for the fullness and I thank you for the heart for my dad. See, my dad got saved through my salvation. My dad's 78 years old. My dad doesn't have cirrhosis and my dad is saved. Isn't that cool? That sure beats me being a 58-year-old with resentment in my heart flashing back to when I was a kid. And sitting at Thanksgiving and dad's there, but I, you know, just have surface relationship because the truth is I'm still bitter because he cost me my childhood. Hello? No, he cost me whatever I give him. If I don't give him that, it don't cost me a thing. It didn't cost me a thing. Jesus saved me, gave me new life. Why am I still coveting my childhood when I'm 58 and I'm born again and I'm in Christ crushing the works of darkness and walking in the light as Jesus is in the light? What's it matter if my dad was an alcoholic, if the Spirit of God is on the inside of me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. what's it matter? <laughs> doesn't, does it? What's it matter if they weren't there? And were, Come on, you think God did that? You think God like... Like was going to my dad, drink another beer. Well, no, but he didn't stop him. That's because he gave men a will. He's not ordering around a bunch of robots. He doesn't have a remote with your name on it. Go this way. Er, go this way. Er, worship me. <laughs> I don't know why I keep doing this. I don't feel like it. <laughs> You want to see something crazy? Like amazing? Crazy amazing? Go to Romans 8. People love this chapter. Probably ought to look at it. My goodness. Can I just read a little here? Wow. Wow. Look at verse 29. This is amazing. For who God foreknew. What did he do? He foreknew. He's the author of life. He knew before you were known. He saw you before you were seen. So he who foreknew never changed your predestination. He never changed your calling, your original purpose and intention and value in him. No matter how far man has walked off the cliff of what they're created to be, God has never lost sight of why we're here. Because love hasn't failed. He's never changed his mind because he's not self-centered. You didn't break his heart. You made a drawl on his heart. 
Parents, well-meaning parents say, well, you just broke the heart of God. That's not a cool thing to teach your kids. Where sin abounds, grace abounds more. It doesn't say where sin abounds, God gets crushed. See, the difference is it's a sad thing when we make him like us and represent that to our children. Because the whole thing you want to teach your children is they're created to be like him, so you better send a clear picture of him through your life. So if you're telling them that God doesn't get a broken heart and you're living with one, that's not a great example of what we can flesh out. So then we just separate and say, well, that's him. This is us. wonder he considers us. It's amazing. He loves us. We're not that lovable. Are you following me? No. You manifest Jesus in your life and you teach your children through the, children through the image of God what God looks like and who God is. You didn't break his heart. You made a draw on his grace. He wants to pull you out of that thing. He knows your life is more than that. He's not crying because of you. He's crying for you. There was a time I was interceding and God was running through a grace. It was a season he put me in for a whole year. It was pretty intense. Uncontrollable tears. Made the carpet wet underneath me. I'd be in board meetings. I'd be in a pastoral office. And it would come on me. There was nothing I could do about it. People were concerned. They said, something's wrong. This ain't healthy. This ain't right. I said, I'm not fighting it. I told God, I'll go where he wants me to go. I'll pray. I'll go to the four corners of the earth. I'll do whatever he wants. I'm surrendered. For a whole year, he put intercession on me in the middle of the... I'd be in the office and I'd feel it coming on me. And I'd have to break away to a children's room. And I would wail. They could hear me over there wailing and crying. He would run through things in the church. I'd see silhouettes in the foyer and conversations and things. And I would just, sometimes I would cry for 45 minutes. And all I could say every time I'd see these things is, mercy, God. Have mercy, God. So after that lifted, time went on. And I'm still interceding and still praying. And, but it wasn't in that season of grace where God was doing it. Because it was like supernatural tears. It was, it was, it was hard to describe. It was a couple months later, maybe even more like a year or so later, I was in a, in a room and I'm praying and I'm crying. And, and I, I mean, I believe I love God, right? And I'm seeing these things. It was some stuff I was aware of and I'm crying, I'm repenting, I'm asking God for mercy. And the Lord whispered to my heart. He said, hey, you know I'm not hurt, right? That's what he said. It's like I'm like taken up for him. Like, I can't believe they did this to you. He said, hey, psst. I'm, like, I'm doing my prayer thing. He, Psst. You know I'm not hurt, right? He said, I'm always hurting. I'm hurting for others. I'm not hurt. And I'm like, duh, yeah. It's pretty important to know because if you understand that, it puts you in that place. You're, you're putting down this wisdom so you can walk in this wisdom. Next thing you know, you're not hurt. Why? Because you understand why he's not hurt. He doesn't seek his own. He's just the highest, best for everybody, so he gave his life. See, love lays down its life. Anything that's not love lives, lives at the expense of. When you know him, you'll love. When you don't know him, you won't love. Just think about it, how we've lived at the expense of each other in our families, in our relationships, and in our jobs. You say, what do you mean? Just cop an attitude that's not healthy in a family of three, four, and you force the others to have to respond to you. You just pull a silent treatment on your spouse and just through body language and a lack of expression, express your feelings and your mood. It's control. It's manipulation. You're just revealing you're not walking with Jesus today like you could. And you're being self-centered. And if your spouse isn't sharp and in touch, they'll feed into it or they'll get in the game with you. Next thing you know, you got animosity in your home instead of the kingdom of heaven. Next thing you know, you have rights and they've been violated. Now you have a counselor or a friend that's saying, I can't believe you put up with them. And next thing you know, your heart's hard and you say, I don't think I love you anymore. That's how it happens, people. That's how it happens. Could you imagine God looking you in the eyes and saying, I don't think I love you anymore? It'd be devastating, wouldn't it? You'd be hopeless. You'd have nowhere to go. Trouble is, when people do that to each other, they get crushed and hurt by it because they have the same vulnerabilities, so they go try to keep meeting the need, keep meeting the need, and the only thing that can meet the need is knowing him and surrendering to him and giving up your life and your rights, because only then are you even fit to be in a relationship, honestly, according to scripture. Now, I know he tolerates us in a sense and has mercy on us in our weakness. In a sense, when I say tolerate us, I don't mean in an evil, bad way. What I mean is he's patient and endures some of the things we do. Like, who knows that we get married and we're not ready? 
who knows we're not even close spiritually sometimes. And we get married in the name of the Lord. (laughs) I'm just saying. And he's just sitting there going, okay. (laughs) Bless you. (laughs) Who knows he's willing to step in and work and stuff, but who knows that he sees what's coming? Who knows all the hardship and all the stuff? It's not blind to him. He sees it. He's all knowing. He sees everything down the road. You know, you tell a young couple as a pastor, do you ever do this? You say, you know, guys, right now, I just think you're rushing things. There's some spiritual stuff I'd love to see grow in your life. You're asking me to do your wedding. And if I'm going to stand there with a clear conscience to be accountable for wedding day, I'm telling you, I think you're rushing things. And if you want me to do the wedding, then I'm asking you if you'd come back and meet a little more. Let's push the date. Push the date. Yeah, let's push the date. It's not the end of the world. Don't you want to be ready on that day? As your pastor, I don't feel like you're quite ready because of this, 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 and this. I'll be thorough with it. I'll make sure you understand why I'm concerned. And I know, I can't tell you how many people say, well, we'll just find somebody else to do the wedding. Thank you. And then they put themselves through things that never have to be because of emotions and pushing the envelope. I've sat through those meetings and I've done everything thorough and I still watched them put themselves through. It's very painful. You know, you hurt for them because they have every answer in front of them, but they just live by faith. And you guard your own heart, not somebody else's. And you live your faith, don't try to live theirs. And people still make mistakes. So we got to walk through this. We got to keep ourselves sharp. We got to stay in this thing. Right? I mean, I had no business getting married, and somehow I have an amazing marriage. I hurt my wife for 13 years, and God redeemed and restored both of us. Since then, we've been married now for 38 years in May. The last 25 was in Christ. Fun time. Eight years of it, my wife was disconnected and blind to who she was and couldn't see her values. So I was honored to love her and keep it in front of her. Yay. I wasn't honored to get hurt, frustrated, and discouraged and bail out. I was honored to lay down my life. And it didn't feel like a sacrifice. Because love is what I'm created for. Not hurt. Who's ever been blessed when you're hurt? Who's ever can tell you you're having a great rocking day when you're frustrated? When you're just angry and have a right to be angry, who can tell me you were like enjoying that and that was like the best moment of your life? (laughs) See, when you look at what a thing produces, you can tell how far off it is or how on point it is. I got a wrap. I wanted to be done by 12. I know. It's not your fault. <laughs> it's, it's, I got all this word in front of me. It's too much. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined. He foreknew us. He predestined to be what? What's your predestination? To be conformed. I'm in Romans 8, 29. If you want to look in a Bible or pull it up on a phone app or something. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined. To be conformed to the image of his son. Wow. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined. Who's that? Whom he predestined. These he also called. Whom he called. These he justified. And whom he justified. These he also glorified. He's talking about men. Glorified, not in a haughty, proud way, by filling us with the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead so we could reveal the glory of God on the earth. Because the glory of God is any made known, any seen or realized attribute of God. It's called the fruit of righteousness. Yeah? So God's anointed us and filled us with his spirit. So Paul, or the psalmist says, and then Hebrew says, what is man that thou art mindful of me? He says, you're his crowning creation and glory. Why? Because we're on the earth to manifest his glory till the whole earth is filled with his glory. You, you've got to be very careful that you're not getting tricked into self-centeredness after you're a Christian. That you're a Christian for yourself, your own gain, your own sake. That God's nothing more than your genie in a bottle or your bus boy. That you position him to fail you instead of change you. Are you with me? Come on. I've just met way too many people that aren't getting this. And they're hurt and frustrated and life is eating their lunch and they have a wrong view of God and they're not inspired and encouraged. And here's the trap. If you have a wrong view of God, you won't draw close to him. 
There's no way you'll be intimate and personal with God if you don't see Him clear. Now I realize there's one night stands on the earth and people get emotionally whacked out and do things they don't need to do or shouldn't do or should never do. But I'm telling you what, I've learned that Christians will not be intimate with God if they have an issue with Him. And that's trouble because if you're not intimate, nobody's getting pregnant. To give birth to something, to have fruit in your life, you have to come together with Him. Come on. It's not good to have a bunch of barren Christians <laughs> that aren't being intimate. <laughs> you got to get alone and be with God so that everything your life gives birth to looks like its father. Are you with me? <laughs> you go in a room, close the door and be with him. Get pregnant. <laughs> you look at somebody, you look at me in the spirit, I'm probably like this right now. My water's probably about ready to break, brother. I'm about ready to bear down and push something out in the Lord. <laughs> where you been? Yeah. When you see what this thing that comes out of me looks like, you'll know where I've been. Because it's going to look just like it's daddy. <laughs> I'm a guy talking like that, and I'm cool with it. It's not weird. It's spiritual. All this natural stuff came from spiritual truth anyway. It's just been so perverted, we can hardly see it clear. It's been so emotionally driven and needs driven and selfish driven. That's why he says, as you know those things, the sexual things in your life, as you know them, kill them. Put them to death as you know them. He didn't say find balance and control them. He said put them to death. That means they have a perverted wellspring, self-centered, twisted. Kill it as you know it. Why? So you can step into the real and the true. That's a whole other sermon and I'm late. There's so much in the Word. Do you see my problem? I can't read one line. I read one scripture and I talk for 20 minutes. I get this, these scriptures are phenomenal. Like he predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son. Whom he predestined, he called. Who he called, he justified. It's the song we sang about the grave and shaking and breath coming into him. We sang the song today. He didn't just do that so we clap and celebrate. He didn't just do that so your sins are just forgiven on the surface. He did it so you're justified through his resurrection. As if you never sinned. He justified you. Oh. And whom he justified, he glorified. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? If he did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not, with the same son or through the same son, give us freely all things? All things. What shall, or who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. And furthermore, he's risen. Who is even at the right hand of God. Who also makes intercession for us. Now watch. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Come on. These people put this stuff on the refrigerator. We, we, it sounds so amazing. But man, we better get it. Watch this. Shall tribulation? Shall distress? Persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword. Well, I think that list would, list would wreck a lot of people. Yeah. I actually think that list would, list would be the end of a lot of people's faith and journey. Yeah. <laughs> See, Paul's preaching something more than self-centeredness here. He's preaching more than gaining something because of him. He's preaching becoming something because of him. I think this list, in all honesty... Way less than this list, I've seen shipwreck tons of people in my life. That's why I preach like a madman when I get a chance and talk about this stuff so it doesn't happen to you. It doesn't have to happen to you. It doesn't. <laughs> what shall separate us from the love of God? I mean, people lose their job. I can't believe why God let me get laid off. What's he trying to teach me? I thought he loved me. I can't believe I'm laid off. Doesn't he know I have bills? You ever hear that? You let another thing add on top of that, and that's the straw that breaks the believer's back. 
It just shows that we have faulty theology that we don't understand. Come on, you get laid off, you still have a God, you still have a covenant. So what's your response? Why do you become laid off? When you get laid off, why do you become laid off? Why aren't you still a son? Why don't you sit in your car and say, wow, I sure didn't see this coming. This caught me by surprise, God. But man, I'm excited to see what you're going to do because I know how much you love me and care for my family. And you know I have bills. I don't even have to talk to you about all this. Man, I'm going to knock on a bunch of doors and I can't wait to see what opens up because this is going to be a season where your glory is revealed. Thanks for loving us. And you're pumping gas and your friend comes by and he has no idea you're laid off because you're not laid off. You didn't become laid off. You just got laid off. You didn't become laid off. There's a difference. Are you getting this? Okay. I'm trying to close. I really am. Believe me. That is written. For your sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors. I'll tell you why we're more than conquerors. He's not talking about always seeing a natural victory in a situation changing. It's because you'll never let the situation change you. You're more than a conqueror because you're established in who you are and why till the end. That's what victory in Christ is. He always causes us to triumph through Christ Jesus, right? And diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ. I just quoted Corinthians to you. Isn't that amazing? Second Corinthians. Wow. Ain't that something? Watch this. Yet we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now watch this. This is amazing. For I am persuaded. That means he's convinced and you're not talking him out of this. That neither death. Now you'll see the same kind of list you just saw in Corinthians. But it's more inclusive. It's more solid. It's more detailed. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, or principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. Sound like the same list, a little more inclusive? Watch. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's on people's refrigerators. People hear that. The drums go boom, 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 and it, Amen. That's what people do. But guess what's not on the list? Nothing on this list can separate you from the love of God in Christ. Guess what's not on the list? Your past. Why? Because your past has the total ability to keep you from receiving the love of God. Now, he'll still love you and he'll always love you. But the past has the total ability to keep you from receiving his love. Ain't that something? That's why it ain't on the list. Because it's not the real you. It has nothing to do with truth. It has nothing to do with eternity. It has to do with the story of the beginning of your days before you got born again or whatever. And what men did to you and who men were. It was a reflection on men, not you. And if you take it personal and internalize it instead of the gospel, you'll never walk in the spirit and live by faith. You'll live by the past. And the past has the total ability to harden your heart, hurt your heart, deceive your heart, and rearrange your view of God. Has the total ability to keep you from receiving the love of God. You see how detrimental living by your past is? I'll be honest, we spend countless hours ministering to people based on feelings, flashbacks, memories, dreams, and impressions. It's all sensually driven, and the just shall live by faith. People say, well, I don't feel loved. And we're trying to minister to them till the feeling of love comes upon them. Are you kidding me? You don't have to feel love. You believe love. How do you believe love? The cross. Jesus was crucified. Man, you stop thinking about it and you lift your hands and say, thank you for loving me. If you didn't love me, your son would have never came. You'd have never died on the cross. Thank you for living inside of me. You say, well, that doesn't feel real to me. Stop being deceived by feelings. When are you going to live out of your heart by simple faith so that you can get a revelation in the eyes of your understanding can truly be enlightened? Listen, I, I, I have encountered the love of God. I have felt the love of God in my life actually many times. I've settled a long time ago. I don't need to feel the love of God. I never asked to feel the love of God. I believe he loves me. And it's the stronghold of my life. Are you getting it? So if I wake up in the morning, whoever woke up and he didn't feel, feel close. Whoever woke up and you just felt far away. Anybody? 
It's happened to me. I wake up and I don't feel real spiritual in the sense, but I never blink. I never go, oh, what's wrong? I don't call a friend and say, you need to pray for me. I feel distant because now I'm back to looking for a feeling. If I wake up and it feels that way, I just smile and chuckle. Father, I thank you that you're right here, that you love me. You'll never leave me or forsake me. I so appreciate who you are in my life. And in about three minutes, that thing I woke up to is so far gone. It's ridiculous. <laughs> yep. And you're heading to the bathroom and you already know who you are. You're heading out the door and what's going to trick you or deceive you, your life for one reason, to manifest his image. All of a sudden, nobody's going to sneak up on you and hurt you and hurt your feelings and break your heart. All of a sudden, your wife's not going to be a little extra quiet and you're going to leave insecure. I wonder what's wrong with her now. Y'all good? If you don't think it's possible to live this way, ask Jesus. He's the one that said, follow me. It's not my fault. I didn't say that. He said, follow me. If you don't think it's possible to live this way, you ought to ask Jesus in prayer. And you ought to take a good look at his word and see if he's given you every possible way to do it. By the power of his spirit and by believing his word. Are you with me? I said it last night and I'll just reiterate it again as I'm trying to close here and I'm actually just about okay. Wow. The only way your life will change in what I'm talking about isn't because you're leaving here gun ho to do it. You become it. And the only way you become this life is in his presence with him. And the first thing you have to be when you're all alone and ain't nobody around to dictate your will, your motives, your conscience, is you and him and your conscience. You have to be an absolute sincere yes to becoming love. You have to want to lay down all your rights. You have to tell him, I don't want to live for anything that has selfishness intertwined. I just want to walk in love. I want to be what I see in you, King Jesus. I honor you so much that I want to honor you with the expression of my life, that it, that it, that it reveals who you are, that I walk in the light as you're in the light. And, I, and you might want to say stuff like this if you're struggling with things in your marriage or your family or your home. And I just declare in, in your presence that nobody owes me a thing. That I don't live to be loved by my spouse. I live to shine. I live to make you known. I live to walk in your love and make your image real in the hearts of men. God, thank you for empowering me. I'm coming after you. I'm not going to let anything change my mind. You start talking like that to the Lord and tell him you're a yes. In the arena of love, grace will start changing you in every area that you need shifted and changed. Just how powerful would it be in your marriage if you wake up every day and say your wife doesn't know you a thing, your husband doesn't know you a thing. I'm alive to be more like you. God, I'm not going to let where they're not ever decide where I am. I'm going to let who you are already settle me. And I'm going to walk in the light and I'm going to shine. And I'm a peacemaker and blessed are the peacemakers for they are the sons of God. I'm not issue oriented. I'm not problem driven. I'm not tit for tat. He said, she said, I'm not selling cheap because I'm not for sale. I'm all in. I wonder if you start talking like that serious to the Lord in prayer. Whoa. That sure beats waiting for your spouse to change. What a low level of life. <laughs> How's that worked for folks? <laughs> Sadly funny, huh? <laughs> well, you don't know what they've put me through. Well, you don't want to, it's like living with them. Wonder if God came to you and said, you know what it's been like living with you. <laughs> Sometimes we ought to slow down on our Wonder if God said to you some of the things you've said to one another or I've said to one another. That'd be devastating, wouldn't it? Man, that's slow down. James said that we're called to be slow to speak, slow to anger, and quick to listen. You know what most of us have been? Quick to speak, ticked off, and don't want to hear it. It's not an accident. Everything's been perverted. Everything's been twisted. That's become fools in this age. So we be wise in the kingdom. Are you with me? So relationship and intimacy with God is the only thing that's going to change you. You don't do this message. You become this message. And you become it through prayer by the person of Holy Spirit. You're saved by grace through faith. And every time when nobody's looking, you're releasing faith in these truths and yielding yourself like clay. The great potter's fashioning and grace is coming to make your faith your reality. Are you with me? 
And then you change because of him. You love him all the more because you didn't bite your lip and try hard. You're not going to get a trophy someday. You're just going to be a believer. And I bet that would be a good day, wouldn't it? If you stand before the Lord and heaven announces, here stands so and so. They believed. And then your canvas comes up. (laughs) I'm telling you, you want that. Whether you realize it or not, you want that. Why don't we stand to our feet? I'm going to close in prayer. You all all right? Okay. Pastor didn't mention anything. He was going to say something to help me with this, but who knows me a little bit? Who's been around where I've been and stuff knows me a little bit. So I'm a people person. I like to hang out. I like folks. I stayed last night. We were the last ones to leave the church, weren't we? Me and you and just one. Yeah, all of us right here. We just left. We left last. But this afternoon, like when this ends, they have a thing scheduled, a leadership thing that we have to go to, and we're going to be there. So I'm just asking you to let me just roll. I would normally hang out and talk. People that know me know that's true. But we were talking about that, and if I I make myself available, it will be a while, and probably just chatting and talking, which I love to do. But if you guys can just let me slip out and go to the leadership thing, that would be probably better. Okay, just for schedule purposes, I'll be back tonight, and I'll make myself totally available tonight. I'll be here, man. I'll be here till the clock strikes midnight, and we got to run, and the carriage changes back. (laughs) No, I'll be here tonight. I'll make myself available. Can we just pray? And when we pray, here's what I want to encourage you to do, because I'm going to pray in a certain way that will probably make sense to what I'm asking you to do. I don't have any of this planned, but... Can you just be a sincere yes before God and just start there today? No matter where your life has been, no matter where your marriage has been, no matter where your family's been, don't wait on somebody else. Don't you wait on somebody else, please. You take the initiative and say, you know what? I'm going to stop limiting my life and denying faith, and I'm going to stop letting other things matter more. I'm going to step in and say yes, and I'm not afraid. I'm not risking failing. I'm privileged to become. I'm going to start on a journey. If I don't start, I'll never get there. And it ain't about quitting and it ain't about being perfect. It's about being pure and going after the prize. Yeah? Are you with me? So I want you when we pray to purpose in your heart as a room to say, you know what? I'm saying yes to love and I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, to empower me and whatever that means for my life. And make my life look so much more like Jesus that people get to know you because they've known me. Would that be sweet or what? Can you be that yes today when I pray? Just start giving your yes to God as we pray. You don't even have to listen to me. I'm going to pray it over you. You have a little contact with God right now and just start there and have communion with him. Who knows? Somebody might get pregnant here yet today. This is awesome. (laughs) Father, we just thank you for your amazing love, the call of the gospel and the purpose of the cross. And we just ask that it would stay before us and burn in our hearts always. That, Lord God, we would understand that you're redeeming something. You're restoring a truth about our lives, our created value, and our purpose. That, Lord God, we never just get caught by religion, never get seduced by religion, never succumb to religion. That, Lord God, we would never just get into a form of something without becoming that thing. That we wouldn't let knowledge about you take the place of knowing you when knowing you changes us. Lord, I'm asking you by the power of Holy Spirit to expose religion in any way in our lives, to expose anything that's counterproductive or compromised. That, Lord God, you would be the wisdom in our life that would come and convict us and point us to these truths because our hearts are saying yes this morning. We're willing to forgive, to release, and to let go all things so we can become what you paid for. And who we are and how we are is going to be determined by the truth of who you are in us. Father, no longer... Do I want life to decide who I am and how I am? I want the giver of life to already settle that. So I'm giving myself to you in a way of commitment, in a strong yes. And I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, to to come and help me and empower me and cause me to become this message in my life. And let my sphere of influence matter in your great name. And let people know you because they've known me. Lord God, we thank you today for that grace on this house. We thank you for that grace on this room. And I pray for restoration in marriages, in families, and in homes. And I pray for great influence in society because of your people walking in love. I pray it's non-optional. 
I pray that your conviction is great in our lives and keeps us in the light of truth, that no one would have the ability to believe discouragement, that you would shake us into the truth and keep our hearts encouraged. Lord God, I pray that no one would feel self-centered or feel sorry for themselves or be focused on themselves without seeing it after today. I pray that your grace would keep us in this truth. And I thank you for healthy homes and families because of it. And I thank you for the manifestation of Christ in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, I'll do this real quick because it's on my heart right now. If you're sick in your body in any way, raise your hand. Just raise your hand if you need healing in any way. Raise your hand. If you're standing beside a